Kisses greet Hope for Haiti leadership on the ground in Haiti. But Sister Giselle's voice commands a different kind of respect in the classroom. Even if that classroom is more of an outdoor pavilion. St. Francois de Sale enrolls more than 1,200 students in the harsh community of Carrefour, a western suburb of Port-au-Prince. A UNICEF tent houses kindergarten and first grade. Quatrième, cinquième, sixième. Sister Dizelle is the secondary school director. She prays for a brighter future to overcome a dark past. Oui, comme ça et... No translation necessary here. Sister Giselle's talking about last year's earthquake. It was completely all rubble and nothing left of it. You can hear the kids from room to room. It's approaching 5 o'clock here local Haiti time, and they are here because they are the poorest of the poor. This is the really the only time they can come to school. And it's this time here about five o'clock that the earthquake hit and the building came crashing down on them. So many died that day because they were the victims of bad luck. The images capture a cruel canvas. 150 students died in an instant. A half hour northeast in Cibert, students at Dominique Savio survived. Their primary school building, however, did not. Students now must learn in outdoor, temporary wooden classrooms. The learning conditions at the temporary school make it difficult for them to keep their concentration because they're not in an appropriate classroom. The playful sounds of lunchtime drum out the reality outside the gates. Tent cities of earthquake refugees surround the campus. Violence is high and electricity is scarce. Everything in Haiti runs off a national grid, but that lasts about two hours. The secondary school was damaged, but repaired by Hope for Haiti. Still, signs of the quake remain on the climb to the rooftop, where Hope for Haiti installed solar panels. Yeah, 11, 12. School director Father Jean-Francois Printemps says the school is a refuge for his nearly 900 students. There are problems at their homes, so they have problems when they come to school. They're thinking of their homes and sometimes they're hungry. Kids leave Dominique Savio with a hot lunch thanks to another nonprofit group. Soon, Dominique Savio's state-of-the-art primary school will be rebuilt. That's the main goal of a school like this. The engineer says it will exceed international building codes, a rarity in Haiti. Not just earthquakes, but also for hurricanes and other types of things. While the earthquake destroy life, they also destroy equipment, tools, and organization. It's, a, it's basically it's an area that's starting from scratch. Meanwhile, back at San Francois de Sale, progress and healing are heard in the hammering of pickaxes. I can't wait. I'm so excited. It's finally, ground is getting broken. Just feet away from burial grounds. A new $4 million school is down the line, funded by a German nonprofit. There is hope after devastation. There is something that their children can aspire to, and this building is going to show that. Hope for Haiti's footprint here is in this temporary library. And you don't need a book to read Sister Giselle's Hope. I can start over, she tells me. I have my life. I can start over. Hundreds of people make this walk down a dirt road each week, all for the chance to see a doctor. And we do it as a triage system, so we'll do any severe cases. One of those people is Janesse Deller. The 17-year-old diabetes patient is getting her foot ulcer treated today at Hope for Haiti's Lakai Infirmary. Rural areas like Ravine Saab still don't have immediate access to health clinics. School director Rode Petit Friere says first aid kits provided by Hope for Haiti are great, but just the start. When the people have first aid, sometimes it's not enough to get to a clinic. A big problem that we have here is we need a clinic. Many of the patients come from very high up in the mountains. This old slaughterhouse turned clinic opened in 2000 to address the need. It treats about 200 patients each week, people of all ages. From 2 to 85. Part of making Haiti a sustainable country starts right here at the infirmary. Basically, everyone who comes through here is asked to pay something, and if they can't afford it, they don't have to. But for example, lab work costs 50 good, or pretty much a little bit more than one American dollar. And people do pay. Records are even kept electronically. 
Though prescriptions are free, they are donated after all. Compared to like the general hospital, this clinic is not constrained by revenues. It's not constrained by the patient's abilities to pay. You just need basic preventive things like that. Dr. Brian Childs, a dentist in Naples, says the clinic is still years behind the times. We just don't have the resources here. You can only do what you can do. Hope for Haiti budgeted $125,000 this year to keep the clinic open. Most of the costs are to pay salaries of the staff of 17. If we didn't have the donations, we wouldn't be able to work. Janess and her family get their care free of charge. Her wounds are healing so well, now she only has to make this walk to the clinic once a month. From the time these supplies are packed in Naples to the time they're shipped, processed, and finally arrive in Port-au-Prince. We get them from customs to here. It takes about five weeks. These are your forklifts. Uh, so all this is moved by hand. That seems like a lifetime to the people on the ground trying to help Haitians. Most of the stuff moves out quickly. Hope for Haiti runs everything through this depot. Medical supplies are in greatest need, of course. We don't even have enough. So we, we use what we can use, but we don't even have enough. Once processed here, shipments are rushed specific to each clinic's need and patient profile. They don't need this adult medication because they're pediatric. They don't get the adult medication. We hold it and give it to another location that does. Prescriptions are tracked to places like the Lakai Infirmary, reaching hundreds of patients each week. We know daily what their needs are. So it's not necessarily a blanket drop. This clinic, for instance, is all out of the birthing kits put together months before in Naples. They had already been distributed to rural mothers and midwives. And there are other places where the women prefer to give birth at home instead of in the hospital. But medications aren't in all these boxes. So I went to the bank and asked them for books in French and Spanish and English. Hope for Haiti board member Jim Lancaster lobbied the World Bank for two years before books finally arrived. There are 11,000 books in the shipment. They will soon be distributed across 26 schools. Still, books are not the number one priority. If it were any hotter, we would start to have problems. But as of right now, we're below 98 and we're okay. The tropical heat and ticking clock mean the shelf life on this medication is limited. We have to make sure that we get them quickly to where they should, they should go because some of them, their expiration date is not that really, really far from here. Five weeks can be a lifetime, especially when life is on the line. Road Petite Friere is lucky by rural Haitian standards. The Ravine Saab school director has a motorcycle to get to work. His 450 students must walk, some hours in each direction. Now imagine a student gets sick. Cholera, after all, has affected nearly a half a million Haitians, according to the Pan American Health Organization. Six months ago, first aid kits like this, packed in Naples, were distributed here and to 11 other schools. These are the oral rehydration salts, so if anybody has cholera, you give this to them. So that resulted in fewer people catching cholera. It's almost disappeared in the area. Before this kit, it could take hours to get to the nearest clinic for something as simple as a headache. Basic prevention, so that way they don't get those illnesses that might escalate to something even worse later. Students sing along with Pato Krisnal, one of two community health workers here. The song is about hygiene and washing hands. Critical just by taking one look at the community latrine students and staff share. Which brings us to Hope for Haiti's crystal clear imprint on this mountainside. This well, built right around the same time of the earthquake, provides a need not only to the school but to the community. The next clean water well is an hour and a half down the road by foot. The goal is for the kids to go home and pass the knowledge and habits on to their families. The same program is in place 20 minutes away at Tetsus, named after the clean water source found at the end of the road. Clean, as you can see, is a relative term here. The locals use this stream not only for drinking, but to wash clothes and bathe. As you can see, yeah. The school is also home to a nursery giving the community a stake in the school. And because of all the heavy rains, you have just a tremendous amount of erosion here. Naples realtor Bill Earls has a background in agricultural science. He says the problem Haiti has is soil. There's just not enough of it. Each student is going to have five seeds to go, to go home and plant. Families in Ravine Saab and Tetsus live in extreme poverty, less than a dollar a day per household. Remaining seeds will be sold to the community for pennies on the dollar. I have this vision that 60 years from now, three generations from now, they'll be thinking about this guy and what this generation has done to reverse this process. Seeds and meds may be small in size, but the education Hope for Haiti leaders believe will have a lasting impact.
A look at the presidential palace in Port-au-Prince proves progress comes hard in Haiti. Hundreds of thousands are still displaced. Temporary tents have become permanent homes. Our cameras visited this tent city days after the 2010 earthquake. The soccer field in Lakai served as a refugee camp. That was then. This is now. The tent city is gone. The only crowds here now come to see sports. For the people in Haiti, they know that there's a life after the earthquake, okay? And the life happened with us coming together. Haitians flock to the stadium to see their presidential team play against MINUSTA, a United Nations mission team. When you play, you're not only playing for one team, but that Haiti is also, as a nation, one team. Bibi Nunez and her group Project Peace Latin America put this together. Their goal, to unite a community torn apart by violence and unrest. But in Haiti, soccer is a universal language. Earlier in the day, 230 students from 10 different schools were outfitted with uniforms and equipped with soccer balls. It's an opportunity to do something for sports education and for the development of children's noble qualities through sports. We know that education and sport goes together. The children will train and play against each other in a tournament. The championship will be played here in May. It's not just a soccer match. It actually gives them the opportunity to make a life out of the game. The pitch points to progress. It may be tough to find, but slowly, normalcy is returning to the Lakai. On assignment in Haiti, Paul Gessler, ABC 7 News.